Hello everyone and welcome back to What A Barb, a pine podcast. I'm Ox and I'm joined by Lecky Beans and Veg as we continue our reread of Romancing Mr. Bridgerton on its 200th anniversary. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome one and all. How are we doing? I detected a bit of valley girl there. A pollen podcast. A pollen <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Like, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm tired. Thriving. <laughs> I worked like 50 hours last week and then I slept a lot yesterday. I literally like slept all day almost yesterday. Like I, I slept in and then took a really long nap, but then didn't get much sleep last night. So we'll see how this week goes. Why was that lucky? Oh, I was rereading the book. <laughs> I was preparing for this. Thank you. Do me assignments for the class. Yeah. <laughs> Just to like locate where we are. So hopefully we're speaking to you on the 14th of April, 2024. But we're recording these in advance desperately. And if you're wondering where we're speaking Mm -hmm. to you from, it's Sunday the 17th of March, right? Which is... Yes, happy St. Patrick's Patrick's Day. Day. Yeah, happy St. Patrick's Day to those of you in April. And to Irish Happy St. Patrick's Day. If you feel like celebrating again, we won't blame you. Yep. In terms of the fandom, it's been a busy, busy week. This has been the week of Italian... Was that this week? No way was Italian pollen this week. Was that this week no wait maybe it it was it was (laughs) tuesday was that tuesday yeah joking me for fuck's sake oh wow that's (laughs) amazing (laughs) the rewatches started today i mean we've done enough rewatches for a lifetime i think we've moved on to paper form now but we're waiting for the 20th we've heard something's gonna happen on the 20th by the time Mm. you'll hear this it'll be a long distant memory but that's where we are at the moment and if we say something Mm. during our reread that future you is like we know more Well, we didn't. We didn't know. Yeah. Beans, my darling beans, how are you doing? I am well. I went out last night. You're almost a birthday bean. Yep. Partially for my birthday, partially for St. Patrick's Day. My birthday's on Monday, the 18th. So if you feel like celebrating a third time, happy birthday to me. (laughs) Yeah, happy birthday beans for a month ago. Happy birthday beans. And I wasn't going to go out originally, but then I was like, oh, I'm going to go fine i've said there were many stages of grief watching you get ready you went through Mm -hmm. the whole process (laughs) yeah so if it's like you haven't gone out in a while and you're feeling kind of like oh i don't feel like going out do it go out have a good time you don't need to drink i really didn't drink at all i'm not a i'm not a heavy drinker or a very any drinker really except on special occasions i just had a good time with a bunch of ladies and i met some new friends i met someone who was literally 24 hours away from being officially divorced and so we celebrated that the bar (laughs) gave us each cards one for my birthday one for her divorce I love they had them on hand. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And then um, that was that was about it. It was pretty nice. And then, Obs, you blinded a cashier, right? I did. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. No. Yeah, I was oh, in Tesco the other day just trying to get some deodorants. All I wanted. I just needed some deodorant, you know? It just, just let me live in peace. And as I took it to the cashier, I dropped it three times. Three times, every single time, like the head, the nozzle bit snapped off and he had to scramble on the floor to pick it up and I <laughs> drop it again and he scrambled again. And I was like, I was like, please just let me leave this earth immediately. Like <laughs> let that asteroid hit. I just want to go. And then he was like, it's good. And he picked it up and he squirted it to test that he'd done it right. And it went straight into his face, <laughs> straight into his eyes. And I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and he just kind of like covered his face and he was like, I love it. Please just go get a new one. Um, <laughs> and basically it's another place I can't shop in London. And you know what? London's a big place, but I'm running out. I'm running out of places I can go. I will say you both have had a week where it seemed like you were living in a sitcom. Both of those seemed like sitcom moments to me. You know why? Because we're both Pisces, Aries, Cusp on the opposite side of the cusp. Yep. And Mm -hmm. this time of year is fucking coming for us. (laughs) It's been a time. Vegetable. Yes. How are you doing? You got lost on your run. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I think I'm okay, but I'm very red in the face still. So maybe I'm not, but hope it's all good. But I think I'm okay. I went for a run and then I went to geocaching. So it's been a good day. I got home at 12.30 and ate chips naked in bed. Oh my God, the dream. <laughs> I don't know how to transition from beans being naked, eating chips or crisps. Do you know what I also like to do in bed? Listen to the audiobook of Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. And I was like, once again, there's so many directions. <laughs> <it's gonna> take- <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Oh, no matter what you get up to in bed, be it listening to Romancing Mr. Bridgerton or eating chips naked or anything else, perhaps having some wildest fantasies, knock yourself out. Welcome (laughs) on in. As we said, hopefully, Godspeed the editing process. We'll be speaking to you on the 14th of April. We spoke to you a few days ago. Honestly, we don't know what's happening these days. Good luck to us all. (laughs) 
But today is a very special day because we are beginning our second reread in honour of a very momentous day in the fandom. Because Wednesday the 14th of April 1812 was quite the day. Where we left our last episode, we were almost dancing in Berkeley Square with our beloved Penn and Colin, but elsewhere in the town, things were a flutter as Lady Danbury had declared a reward for the uncovering of Lady Whistledown's identity. How are the ton handling the new game of the season? Let's find out. The time has come to choose your own bean venture. Ba-da-da-da. <laughs> Beans, you're up. Yes. Are you ready to be challenged? Challenge me, baby. Someone is injured searching for Lady Whistledown, but how does the injury happen? A, when a door is opened, a man who had been eavesdropping trips and falls to the floor. B, a woman scrutinising suspects at a ball develops eye strain and has to miss social events for a week while her eyesight recovers. C, a man dramatically opens the door of a carriage to reveal his suspect, only to knock himself unconscious and let the suspect get away. Mm. Or D, a woman twists her ankle, chasing down one of Lady Whistledown's paper boys. Ooh, I'm going to go with eye strain. This is a trick question, isn't it, Lecky? It's a bit of a trick question, but the correct answer yeah. was ding, 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 D. A woman twists her ankle chasing down paper boys, but Hyacinth is also number A. It was in a man mm. who'd been eavesdropping who falls to the floor. It was Hyacinth who actually did that. Oh. Indeed, Lady Whistledown herself reports on the injury and is rather scathing in her assessment of the Ton's people, writing, This author has chronicled the activities of the Ton for over a decade now and has found no evidence that they do indeed have anything better to do with their time i love it it's like pack this the fuck in you kids <laughs> i have a question for you mm-hmm. about this do you think we'll see like tons people chasing down paper boys like in the book it would be quite funny wouldn't it it would but i wonder if maybe the search for lady will down is too serious for people to be <laughs> hunting down paper boys i wonder if it like develops like, at first it's funny thing lighthearted, and then becomes more serious yeah it's lighthearted mm-hmm. because like i could so imagine people running down and doing that but then it like develops into like more sinister mm-hmm. yeah like yeah they've got cross buzz out <laughs> from the paper voice. So the ton is a buzz with the search for Lady Whistledown. But speaking of, where is she, Lecky? We find our lovely Penelope once again cutting across Barclay Square on her way to number five. Very sadly, there is no Colin and no almost dancing, and Penelope can't decide if that's a good thing or not. But she turns up to number five only to find Eloise is out, so she decides to wait in the drawing room with some refreshments and the latest edition of Lady Whistledown. We have a little line here from Julia. Penelope had already read it, of course. It was delivered quite early in the morning and she made a habit out of perusing the column at breakfast. Now we all know by now that Penelope is Lady Whistledown but book readers at the time, way back when, you certainly didn't know and you only found <laughs> out when Colin does in Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. Oh my gosh, is that true? I had no idea. I did wonder. Yeah, <laughs> this is a little funny play on the words because of course Penelope had already read it but yeah. the book readers were also in the dark. There were definitely clues like she was like hyper obsessed with Colin and stuff in the books earlier but they didn't know. So my question to original book readers and I know that there are many of you out there. Who did you all originally suspect to be Lady Whistledown as the books were originally released? Hmm. I kind of like that they included us knowing Penelope right away because... It makes it fun. I think the way that they revealed her was really good. I'll, that's all. Mm-hmm. I think it makes sense in the show because people would have literally Googled it straight away. Yeah. And it was a very last minute, we've covered this in 108, but there was a very last minute addition to reveal her. I think they were yeah. originally going to film like a scene where we thought it was Cressida. Cressida. It was far more interesting to like bring us into it and see it from Penn's perspective for a season than to pretend we hadn't all Googled it. Yeah. And honestly, it was a letdown when we figured out who the gossip boy was in Gossip Girl. So. <laughs> but speaking of gossip, girls and gossip boys what's penelope up to so the ever curious penelope is a little bored waiting for eloise and notices a book (gasps) lying open on a nearby table she quickly realizes it's a handwritten journal and she can't stop herself from taking a peek i was in my car listening to this and the amount of time she spends like resisting it's like (laughs) i don't know how many pages it is in the book but it's it took me like (laughs) all along the south of the thames (laughs) (laughs) she's like One foot in, one foot out. Yeah. And the very, very first words of this page. 22nd of February, 1824. (laughs) Trudos Mountain Cyprus. <laughs> <laughs> wow, vivid, vivid interpretation there. Penelope immediately realises it's Colin's journal from his recent Cypriot travels. As Veg says, she definitely has an extended time trying to decide whether to read it. There's even one bit where, do you know the bit where she like looks at her feet and tells them to move? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, girl, have some control. 
<laughs> she has a bit of inner turmoil because she knows it's an invasion of privacy, but she decides he shouldn't have left it open. That's victim blaming. In an empty house with no idea Pen was about to rock up. She's like, fair's fair. So she keeps on reading. You know what, Pen? Whatever helps you sleep at night, love. But you know, worms can. You might as well keep reading and read she does, catching up on all of Colin's thoughts about warm baths, soft rushes of foam and February chills. She's having a great old time. But, you know, speaking of Colin, has anyone seen him? Wait a second. What does worms can mean? Is that a phrase? Is that an idiom? Can of worms. You can't put the worms back in the can. If you open a can of worms. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't get... Actually, maybe that's the wrong phrase. I think you could put the worms back in the can. I mean, you could scoop up the worms, presumably, unless they like dig down into the earth right away and like evade your clutches. Look, I never said I was a writer. Colin's the writer. <laughs> I'm just doing my best. <laughs> the time has come to choose your own bean venture. Ba-da-da-da. Beans. I'm coming out. Unless you're a worm, in which case you're going back into the earth because you're not going back in. I'm coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the worm singing as they come out of the can. <laughs> We're coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Colin and what is he doing when Penelope finds his journals? A, he was feeling dirty, and by that I mean he decided to take a bath after exerting himself while fencing. Mm -hmm. B, he was having a shitty day, and by that I mean he was relieving himself. C, he had a headache from thinking about Penelope too long and decided to take a nap. D, he couldn't stop thinking of the black parasol Penelope was carrying during their last meeting, so he just dashed to the shops to buy one for himself. He's pooping. (laughs) That is correct. (laughs) You are correct. (laughs) Well, call off the search party. All is well, because just as an enraptured Penelope reaches out to turn over the page, in he walks. And my God, he ain't happy. But he is feeling a little more comfortable. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) His relief turns to horror as... What are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) I what that was. I can't believe you did that to me when I was taking a drink. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly how he says it. I hope we can just ADR you straight into the show. Hell yeah. He storms across the room, grabs his journal and angrily confronts her about reading it. He is very, very flustered and that good old, previously unknown but starring character of the book, Colin's dodgy temper, makes his grand debut. How is he taking it, Lecky? Colin is furious to find Penelope reading his writing and his anger takes her aback. She says she'll leave, but he very dramatically declares that he's moving out that afternoon anyway. Damn, boy. (laughs) So he'll leave because you've so obviously taken over the house. Okay, wow, Jesus. Calm down, babe. But he's so dramatic. Yeah, Yeah, this is the start of angry Colin in this section of the reread and I do not like angry Colin and I hope that that is quietly smoothed over. I don't know. I'm just not into like angry men. I will say that. Yes, Veg, you're right. This is definitely the appearance of angry Colin and he is going to appear in quite a few more scenes throughout the book. This is definitely something that fans have debated, I think. Obviously, like it's a very different medium. It's a very different time now. We have talked about the differences between show Colin and book Colin, but I feel this is just where they are different. I think he can get upset emotionally, but I don't think he's capable of that like explosive anger at her yeah in that very targeted way he can be emotional and express that but i just feel like outright like anger shouting at her making her feel uncomfortable because we have seen colin when he's upset and it's never it's different from the way that it's described in the book and i would say that even when he raises his voice in the show i think that in general Colin's demeanor and how he expresses himself when he's angry is he's a little bit more articulate than he is in the book. And I think that's a good direction for his character as well, because I think Mm -hmm. it's really hard, especially in this era, like having such an aggressive male character it's, it's just not good. You know, they do the same thing with Antony. They tone down his anger and everything. Mm. They show anger in a way that's, like, healthy or needs some work. Needs some work, but they're willing to work on it. And I think that's mm-hmm. that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's definitely a gentle and more, more sensitive character in the show, I think. Right. But, you know, I think show Colin is also a bit of a drama queen. Oh, for sure. So just expressing it in a different way. <laughs> But Penelope tries to defend herself here because she's really hurt by his burst of anger and she's never had it, she's never seen it, she's never had it directed at her before. He turns his back on her, irately gathers his things and... 
Blood has been spilt, the gods are appeased. Penelope immediately rushes to his aid, grabbing a piece of paper to catch the blood. I love that she <laughs> thinks that the carpet is more important than his hand. She's like, yeah. boy, this is expensive. <laughs> but they wish they had one of those washable rug co lamps from Rugable, eh? Oh my god. <laughs> We're not sponsored. Please feel free to send me a rug. So she gets him to sit down, she slips her hand into his breast pocket to retrieve a handkerchief. I remain devastated it's not his cravat. Although she does note the warm beat of his heart whilst rummaging around in there. <laughs> he might be in pain, but his anger seems to dissipate a little bit as he turns his attention on reassuring her. What's Pen got to say for herself, Lex? Well, she is sorry for reading his journal, but as she's watching him, she realizes he feels insecure about his writing, hence his reaction to finding her reading it. So she insists on telling him, Colin, it was wonderful. Uh, wait, hey, wait, did Kenzie and Pen, do you want to chime in here? Oh, okay. Colin, <laughs> it was wonderful. I was just like I was there. Just like show Penelope, she really <laughs> believes in him and encourages him. Oh, gosh. And speaking of did someone say praise kink i said praise kink i screamed it at you in voice memo yesterday yeah, you did you just that. said it as a, i had no idea it was so out of context you just said as a three second clip of it going praise kink yeah because i think you were in the car so your bluetooth kept disconnecting you so there was just like three seconds of yeah. like a bunch of like three second long like voice memos and one of them was just praise kink i was not driving for the listener colin is immediately preening at her words praise kink in fact he's finding himself very distracted during this whole scene realising not only how intelligent she is, but that he truly values her opinion on literature. Add that to the list of interests you've got around Penny with the gemology. Mm. Oh, and there's also a whole moment where he finds herself staring into her eyes, thinking that he will never be able to forget the colour, just normal friendly things. <laughs> and the two have a very sweet moment discussing Colin's writing. As you say, like, Penelope really does instantly believe in his talent. And it's not only from like a loving, I'd support you no matter what way, but she approaches it from like a quite a technical, critical perspective too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Colin is encouraged to let Penelope keep reading and the two discuss a passage about Colin's feelings toward travel and his feelings about home. And we'll return to this in just a moment. But Penelope checks on his hand and decides he's not going to die of blood loss anytime soon. But Colin very sweetly finds himself hoping their conversation doesn't end. And then, in true Colin fashion, being terrified at the realization that he doesn't want their conversation to end. Oh, Colin. Unfortunately for him, the conversation does continue. And Colin has this moment of realization after speaking with her that he does love writing. And their conversation then turns to something very familiar for the show fans, Pollen and Purpose. Penelope expresses her envy that Colin can travel and Colin shares his own dissatisfaction with his life, especially his travelling and the way he's seen in society as a charmer. I always feel bad for Colin here, right? Because I think Penn's a bit harsh on him. Veg, I'm interested in your perspective on this. I think, right, he's there sharing his deepest insecurities, his frustrations about his life, his vulnerabilities, and Penn's like, how dare you have issues? Yeah. What do you think? I think it's a bit... Like, she just apologise for it, but... It annoys when people do that in real life. Like, you complain and they're like, oh, someone has it worse. It's like, I know, but I like, just want to vent, babe. Let me be miserable for two seconds, Penelope. <laughs> yeah. It's nice that she's getting him to, like, check his privilege. You know, that's always something that mm, is good, nice. good to do. Stay humble. But yeah, I, she doesn't quite go about it the right way. I'm just saying he's entitled to feel how he feels. And, you know, mm -hmm. she does reflect on that later. But regardless of how we feel, Penelope storms out of the room wondering, perhaps for the first time in her life, just who he was. Oh dear, oh dear. Much to discuss. Let's jump in. This is a very well-known scene in the books. And I think many fans want to see it appear in some form on the show. I know all of us are definitely holding out hope for writer Colin. But what do we think about the journal scene? How do you think this is going to play out? I'm wondering, how do you think Pen is going to find the journal in the show? versus the setup that we have in this scene. We have the still from 302, yeah. which is his hand cutting. Yes. And we've theorised it before privately, like, is the journal scene going to be the same as the hand scene? Are they going to chop it up? Will they be divided? I'm pretty sure it was Lecky that was the one that thought, you know, they're going to dash off to whatever room. He was going to yeah. go back and get, like, a coat or something. Sure. That she left out there, and he was going to walk back in and find her reading it, and then freak yeah. out. So we do have a bit of context for maybe not the journal scene, Scene, but the hand cutting scene for sure they might be connected scenes hopefully they are we're gonna have the lessons the remarkable shade of blue mm -hmm. and that is going to transition into what we now know is the study scene yeah and so what are we thinking are we thinking that that is when it like we said before that he's going to leave the room briefly she's going to find his journals read it he's going to come back and be mad well i don't know if he'll be mad well this we'll is see the question how it goes. 
is he going to have the same reaction? Or is it going to be like a slightly different reaction, but driven from the same place of vulnerability and insecurity? Yeah, I think, well, we were talking about the other day, we'll get into this in a minute, but the mm-hmm. content of his journals might be different than it is yeah. in, the, in the book. So there may be another reason that maybe he is upset or concerned. Well, Lecky, that's an interesting point because the difference between the book and the show is that in the show, she has read his writing before. So it's not a surprise to her that, it wouldn't be a surprise to her that he writes. I think it would be a surprise to her that he is writing in this medium. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we know from 202 for example that he found it very encouraging when she'd write to him and read his Mm -hmm. words and write back Mm -hmm. so I think it can't be the thing of oh my god you're reading what I've written just out of insecurity about the nature of writing but I think it's where we're finding them both and why he's going to find it an exposing moment yeah Yeah. and his his words may be exposing in a way that he doesn't want her to see Mm -hmm. yeah because as we said Penn is familiar with his writing but she hasn't replied to his latest letters and we saw a tiny bit of that insecurity in the goodnight Mr. Bridgerton scene Mm -hmm. where he was like you didn't reply no one replied (laughs) I think we theorized before that he found that such an important emotional outlet in season two and ultimately he might have unknowingly found it a creative outlet that he then didn't have yeah. during his most recent travels because she refused to write to him so we've wondered if the way he's going to travel that emotional and creative outlet is by journaling mm-hmm. and that because she hasn't replied to him and he's feeling vulnerable about that will he find it very exposing that she then finds these private journals mm-hmm. but Lecky, what do you think because obviously we see what he's written here and it's all about Aphrodite and the sea foam and all the good stuff. He has written journals. What do you think they're going to be? I think that he may have written about her, or at least he's his subconscious has written about her, that Ooh. maybe he was thinking of her and didn't realize it. And you have a theory about this. Yeah, so I had a theory the other day, right? I was thinking about, do you know the episode title of two, How Bright the Moon? Mm-hmm. We were discussing like, is it like a quote from like a famous book or a play? I know there's been some theories at Shakespeare, but it doesn't quite fit. And we know that there's like a lot of like moon imagery in that episode because it's like the, the moonlight ball it's the osterly ball but mm. i was wondering do you think how bright the moon could be an extract from his journals mm. that she mm-hmm. reads that would be super interesting oh my god what would, i would love is when she's reading his journals do you think we're going to get luke newton's voice reading them out Aww. or do you think we're going to get like a vignette of his travels or something <gasps> oh i hope so Aww. i hope so they can't just include a shot of a page it'll be <sighs> either penelope's voice we hear or his on tiktok mm. where they're like pause to read <laughs> 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 I think I'd like it if it was his voice, but her imaginings of his travels. Oh, yeah. Mm. Like her seeing him over there. Lucky. Do you think it could be that he was writing about a certain Miss Penn? Yeah, so I think, well, I feel like, you know that boy was sitting somewhere looking at the moon and thinking about Penelope during his travels. So maybe there is like an entry where he mentions that he's watching the moon and he wonders if she's watching it too. <laughs> Or it could even be more subtle than that with him wondering if anyone else at home is thinking about him. But we know Mm -hmm. really he means her because she's the one who's not running back to him and the only one he really wants to correspond with. So maybe his subconscious is hinting that it is her. And then she reads that. And also, Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out that there's some precedence for this in the book as Bukhala not only writes on his travels that his surroundings remind him that Mm -hmm. this is not his home, but he also writes about Aphrodite, as we mentioned, and her Titian reddish hair, which is like Penelope's. So that means we could get some perhaps poetic prose where show Colin alludes to Penn in some other manner. That would make sense as to his reaction if he had Mm. written something very, very personal, especially if it's pertinent to her, even if he doesn't really understand why it's so vulnerable, even if he doesn't understand that why he's written that way about her, that Mm -hmm. that could be where the reaction comes from. It's not like, oh, you've discovered that I like to write. It's, oh my God, this is, you rejected my writing because you consent to a letter being read by the recipient. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point Mm -hmm. of the form. Whereas a journal, it is writing, but it's personal. It's not meant to be consumed by anyone else. It's supposed to be your thoughts that you wouldn't put anywhere else. Whereas Penelope's method of writing has always been either letters or something that is designed inherently to be published everywhere. Yeah. So it's coming from a very different state for both of them. Mm -hmm. But would Penn understand that he was writing about her at that point? If she did read something incriminating in his journals? I'm not sure. I'm torn on on this. I feel like it could be obvious to us, but not her. It could be interesting if Penn maybe admits that she felt similarly to how Colin felt, if he's talking about Mm -hmm. his loneliness, that something is missing from his life, Mm -hmm. while praising his words. Or if it is overtly romantic, maybe Colin starts to understand that Penn might actually return his feelings if she praises his words, but kind of nervously avoids the subject he was referencing, if she does get what he was talking about. Watch her think he's talking about a different woman. Oh, no. 100%. See, I think it's going to be a little bit different. I think he might be writing about his own loneliness. And then Mm -hmm. I think their conversation is going to be more of, oh, Colin, that's really good. 
whatever. And he's like, are you sure? Blah, blah, blah. And she goes, I've always told you your writing is good. And then they're staring at each other and there's a beat. And then it's Mm -hmm. like, oh, you're still bleeding. (laughs) (gasps) I can so see that. Well, it's weird because the conversation they have here in the book goes, as, as they mellow into the conversation, he starts to share his thoughts again. And he says, it's funny how travel can do that to a person. And she's like, do what to a person? And he says, make one appreciate home. Yeah. She's his home. I would die if they said this, if they had this conversation while staring into each other's eyes, like on the floor of the study. To add on to what I was saying, Mm -hmm. you know, where she's like, I've always said your writing is good. They have a beat. And then they both look over and they're looking at his hand again. He says, you know, it's it's funny what travel can do to a person. And she looks Mm -hmm. up and she's like, oh, like, what do you mean? And then he's like Mm -hmm. looking at her when she looks up just to continue that moment. And that theme of when he gets back Pirate Colin and he looks straight over the thing he does when he arrives to his actual brick home is turn to her and look yeah. over at her. And there's another moment, Lecky, which I think you really like, where he's reflecting on his travels and he says, can one appreciate perfection when it's a constant in one's life? Mm-hmm. And this is very revealing, I think. It's very reminiscent of Colin in 207, that speech he gives yeah. Penn about how she's so constant and loyal. And mm-hmm. having her presence taken away in season three does seem like it could be a thing that helps him start to appreciate her in a new way like he does here in the book. At the very least, it's like a piece of the puzzle. It really is clever how how the writers have included elements of the book in like different seasons as well. And I mean, all of the yeah. books across the yeah. board, there's so many moments from each of them where the spirit of their love is for each of the characters. Yeah, they do have references. I've noticed some of the scenes in this sort of excerpt of the book we're going through, you've got almost the purpose scene. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 100%. Like, you know, there's sort of moments are peppered in earlier on in the journey for us, and that really helps frame their relationship. Yep, the way the writers work, it really complements the book and mm-hmm. elevates the writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, like you say, Beans, it isn't a direct adaptation, but it's like the soul of the story. Yeah. yeah. The mm-hmm. Like the thematic resonance carries mm-hmm. through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I have to say that obviously now we have a picture from the equivalent of this scene in the show, or from what yeah. we understand to be the equivalent. And did you know, in that still, they're staring at each other, and they have such mm-hmm. an interesting look, and she's holding his hand And in the book, there's this very sweet and quite familiar moment that I think has a lot of resonance with this, Mm -hmm. where Penelope looks up at him and thinks, when his eyes met hers, they were filled with humour and maybe just a touch of admiration and something else she'd never thought to see. Vulnerability, hesitancy, and even insecurity. And she also says, I'm not sure, she shrugs, it's always interesting to find out there is more to someone than meets the eye, don't you think? Lecky, what does this remind you of? Lady Danbury's words to Penelope earlier in this book. They really stay with her, don't they? Yes. So if Lady Danbury does say something similar to Penelope and she applies it to Colin, like as she Mm -hmm. does here in the show, that could be interesting. But I just want to say this would also be really great staring into each other's eyes dialogue, especially if Lady (laughs) Danbury does make that comment earlier in the Mm -hmm. show. Yeah, and I think it could be a similar moment. And I think this is a turning point for him. Not not the turning point, but a turning point. And Luke Newton has said it himself where he's just going to start to see in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. And I think what's nice about this scene is she sees a different side as well. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Um, that's the emotional connection connection like we'll have other moments where he'll see her in yeah. terms of the sexuality aspect but this will be mm. well apparently it could be kind of spicy who knows he, she might say that and then he might just pin her down on that bed who bloody oh, knows amazing. to talk about leaving this scene do you think we're gonna end it similarly where they get into no. this big disagreement no. and then she no. storms out because they're like committed to the lessons at this point it just wouldn't make sense for them to have another argument right away mm. i feel like maybe later in the episode they'll have the cessation of the lesson something will happen that will put a stop to the lessons but Mm -hmm. right now this is seemingly their first lesson she's not going to storm out of it I feel like this is going to end on a very different note yeah Mm -hmm. and he won't be angry because he knows he's on way for thin ground So, late that evening, back to Book Cullen, who feels like absolute shit after his argument with her. He's suddenly very worried that he's done irreparable damage to their friendship, which, again, classic Colin, worries him even more because he didn't realise how much he valued having her around. What is going on, Lek? So, according to Colin, the world seemed to be shifting. He'd only been back in England for a fortnight, but already Penelope had changed. Or maybe he'd changed. Or maybe she hadn't changed. But the way he saw her had changed. She mattered. He didn't know how else to put it. I think that's an interesting template for show Colin's 
return. What do we think? Mm -hmm. Having the world shift unexpectedly and not really being able to pinpoint what has changed or who has changed, Mm -hmm. but almost going with it and just... Yeah. And and this does come back later in the book where he's like, I don't know when, it doesn't matter. This is how I feel. Like in 201, Colin's like, glad to see nothing has changed. Here in season three, he comes back. Everything's different and it keeps Mm -hmm. changing. Like at first, Mm -hmm. Penelope doesn't want to talk to him. Then they're friends, but there's something different about their relationship right off the bat. Yeah. And when you're constant in the world keeps moving, it's like, how do you keep up with that? Mm -hmm. But poor Colin is sent spiraling. He even thinks about that day that we heard about last episode when Penelope overheard him years before. Interestingly, he reflects that it had been one of the most awful moments of his life. Again, nice to see we're not being overly dramatic there, Colin. But it is confirmation that that day really stuck with him and his way to cope with that information is to repress it as much as possible, which we'll see (laughs) later when he realises that he always knew that she had a thing for him. Mm -hmm. But he pushed it down because he didn't know how to deal with it. Colin Mm Bridgerton's subconscious suppressed on page, suppressed on screen. But there's only one way to make it up to her. We're off to a musical. Late that evening, Collins dragged himself off to the infamous Smythe Smith musical on a one-man mission to make amends to his dear friend. There's one thing I know about the Smythe Smith musical, it's that it has a staunch fan base amongst the pollen fandom. <laughs> I once made the mistake of suggesting the opposite and um, the pitchforks were being sharpened. <laughs> so Smythe Smith musical lovers... I see you. I hear you. It's a much loved occasion, unless you happen to be anyone in the ton. <laughs> Veg, what exactly is on the programme for tonight? Well, essentially, the Smythe Smith musical is not the kind of musical or musical that Obs and I go to see. It's basically a concert. So you get whichever Smythe Smith um, women are in the market for husbands that season. They basically play instruments not particularly well. And it's a big pain point for everyone in the ton who has to go and watch and politely sit there yeah. but as Penn notes which I think is so sweet and is part of the reason I'm obsessed with Penn is she goes and she always sits in the front row and just like smiles and claps and like makes them feel nice and it's because she says there's always most of the Smythe Smith girls sort of just kind of unaware and think they're doing quite well but there's always one Aww. who's painfully aware of how awful this situation is and how bad they look and she's yeah. just like supporting that girl. Before we move on I will mm-hmm. say this And I mean it with my whole heart. If you have a hobby, you do not need to be the best at your hobby. If you have something you enjoy, you do not need to be the best at it. I am so tired of people being like, why is this your hobby? You're not even good at so and so and so. If you like it, keep doing it. Don't let anybody take away the hobbies that you enjoy. Okay? If you like it, you fucking like it. And it's so mean for people to make fun of people who pick up a musical instrument, who sing, who do art or whatever because it makes them happy. And then they're like, but you're not good at it. Why are you doing this? Shut the fuck up. Enjoy the things that you have. Don't make fun of people for having hobbies. This is why Beans gives the best advice, by the way. (laughs) Beans, do you enjoy podcasting? Sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Goes up and down. (laughs) <laughs> oh beans thank you darling we do love you keep on vitamin string quartetting your little heart out my smiths <laughs> we're here for you exactly do you think we're gonna get the musical speaking of in the season so i was thinking about this and i thought why bother introducing the family in queen mm. charlotte if they weren't going to appear Smart. again in season three and i was yeah. also thinking it could be really funny if they did like a deliberately terrible strange cover of some sort of like jerky <gasps> song or yes. one hit wonder like Mambo number five was the song that came to mind last night. Oh my god. Oh my okay, first of all, first of all, I would die if that was included in season three. I (laughs) fucking love it. I love it. We're gonna see that on the playlist and be like, what? (laughs) Mambo number five. (laughs) I was talking about this with Lecky earlier. Here's the vision, right? Let's say that there's like a dramatic pollen moment. I know it doesn't fit with what we've just said but like just let's go into it the musical could happen at any point we'll get into this in a second imagine there's like a heart-wrenching moment like they're in strife they can't be together we're all on the floor we're all crying we're all screaming in pain they're at the musical it's so tense and then a Smythe Smith girl just steps up and everyone in the crowd is like is it going to be Mozart number 16 is it going to be Beethoven number 22 <laughs> and then she very solemnly goes ladies and gentlemen of the ton tonight we'll be performing Mumbo number five <laughs> And then we just like, and then it just plays, right? And then we just watch. <laughs> you know, in the song when he makes that like growling noise, like, Row! like uh, yeah. I want a really good like string instrument noise doing the. <laughs> 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 and if I don't see it, 
I want reshoots, is all I'm saying. (laughs) (laughs) Or Lecky to edit it in, she could do it. (laughs) I think we might see this My Smith musical. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it'll come at this moment. I think yeah. this moment here, the, the beat that we have in the story of, of the pollen beat is Osterley. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I yeah. think Osterley replaces this. But I think we could still mm-hmm. go to a musical later. Mm-hmm. It might be like a really funny, like I think like you said before, it might come in like a montage or something. Or yeah. like, we don't dwell on it, but it's there as a tip of the hat to the fans and is a really yeah, funny right. comedy moment. Because it is that comedy that works for the season i think it'd be great too if there was like a moment with the family whatever they're talking about something and then it cuts to just one of the smith smith girls playing violin or piano poorly or something like oh, that yeah. that would be funny because then it could sh- it, we could immediately just like do as like a camera pan to mm. whomever is at the party maybe it's a conversation between debling and pen or something like that yeah comical pan i really like that idea yeah or it'll be like like they're at the Smith Smith home, whatever, they're holding a ball. And then mm. Debling and Penn maybe having a conversation or Penn and Colin. But I think, you know, they have to have like a Debling and Penn convo at some point, duh. And you can hear one of the girls in the background play and both Penn and Debling look. The reason why I include Debling is because the juxtaposition of the poor musical playing kind mm. of plays into the fact that they're not meant to be together, you know? Ooh, so it's like, it's like sort like of symbolic. An- the symphony or something. Yeah. I like your idea about Debling being involved. And we're going to get to this in a minute when we go through the scene. But let's say that this moment is taken like a few episodes later, like episode three or episode four. Yeah. In the scene in the books, you have like Penn is sitting with like Lady Danbury and everyone and, and right. Eloise and such. And Colin like makes such a big faff of like stumbling in and like pushing past yeah. everyone to sit yeah. down behind her. And she's like, for fuck's sake, imagine how funny that would be if she was with Debling sat there. Mm-hmm. And it's such a rom com moment of him like making a big entrance and being like, it's cozy over here and he like squishes in between them or something like that mm-hmm. makes it a big moment or not even that he Debling's on one side Colin's on the other Debling's leaning over to talk and Colin's trying to too and they both make eye contact and Colin's like fuming to add on to the sort of the comedy bit of it all and like the chaos like the chaos of those two trying to get her attention to talk to each other mm-hmm. but then getting distracted by yes. how <laughs> how terrible the music is like they yeah. can't even concentrate on trying to focus on Penelope because all of a sudden they're just like wincing at yeah. Mambo mm. number five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we so I really need that to do Mambo number five. That's so funny. <laughs> Oh, that's incredible. Lucky you will be making edits if it doesn't happen just to let you know, clear your schedule. So back to the book, Penn has turned up. Who else is there, Lex? So Lady Danbury approaches. She kind of forces her way in there, sits next to Penelope, and we find out that Lady Danbury also enjoys this My the Smith musical. Probably the only two who do. Aww. So Lady Danbury says, I was that girl too, Miss Featherington, she said, so quietly that both Eloise and Felicity were forced to lean forward. Eloise with an, I beg your pardon, and Felicity with a considerably less polite, what? <laughs> But Lady Danbury only had eyes for Penelope. It's why I attend year after year, the older lady said, just like you. And for a moment, Penelope felt the oddest sense of connection to the older woman. Aww. Weeping. And it's that parallel that we think we're going to get in season three between the two characters, the former, the wallflower and the, you Mm -hmm. know, the former wallflower. I also just think this whole thing, what Veg was saying about the way that Penelope goes to support them is, it's very true that in both the book and the show, she uses Lady Wistan to kick up, not down at people. Yeah. But what of Colin, speaking of, where is but what of Colin? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Colin has made it to the musicale. He's busy being fawned over by the Tom, though, due to his bandaged hand. Let's just say he is less than thrilled about that, however, as he colorfully shares with Antony. Bandaged Colin, wanting to make amends. Now, where or where have we seen a bandaged Colin before. Ooh, I think we've seen him in Osterley. Osterley, episode two. Now, as we mentioned earlier, do you think that this story beat of them could be at the Osterley Ball instead and we come to the smile yeah. later? And could it be that Colin turns up either maybe post-argument or maybe it's like that still of them arriving, the family arriving that we have with mm-hmm. Eloise, mm-hmm. Ice Queen in front. Mm-hmm. He looks a little bit I don't know, like sheepish, a little bit nervous. Do you think maybe they've ended the study scene on like a strange beat? Not necessarily an argument, but something's happened and they're both trying to like process it or repress it or deal with it. Yeah, he seems maybe contemplative. Like maybe Mm. he's been thinking things, but I don't think they end on a negative note. I feel like just every moment he spends with Penelope in episode two is pushing them towards that first kiss. So he's just dwelling on this new awareness that he has of her. But something I don't think that we've considered is that even 
if Colin tries to hide Penelope, maybe when he's escorting her out of the house, Eloise mm-hmm. still happens upon them anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, she yeah. still walks up, and then they're having an argument, and that's, Colin's just like, where is this coming from? And then that's just yeah. sort of, like, why Eloise is so icy. Yeah. But in the world of the book, it's time to take our seats. Lady Danbury, Penelope, Felicity, and Eloise find themselves in a discussion of the identity of Lady Whistledown. And during the discussion about Lady Whistledown, Lady Danbury shares her belief that she must be someone that no one suspects and so she herself can't be the writer and so who does Danbury suggest as the culprit she says I think you could be Lady Whistledown adding there's more to you that meets the eye Penelope Featherington I think it's a very sweet moment because Penelope feels very like emboldened and supported throughout this whole conversation yeah. and I just reminded that in the book her confidence comes from three ways almost it comes from herself and then it comes from Colin and Lady Danbury mm-hmm editor's note, when Lady Danbury says there's more to you than meets the eye, Penelope Featherington, it really reminded me of when Colin says, you are Penelope Featherington, don't forget that, in the trailer that we just received. Seems like a sweet little parallel between the book and the show, with Penelope supported and emboldened by those around her by being assured that everything she needs, she already has within her. But a little quick discussion point, Lady D has it figured out in the book. So she, I think she has the pollen card down. She has the Lady Whistledown card down. Do you think she's going to figure it out in the show at this early in the point? I think, okay, so what we've seen from Lady Danbury in the show is that while she is knowledgeable, she does get things wrong sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I mean, especially with the Kate and Anthony situation. So I think that she might not know originally, but when she starts to focus in on Penelope... Spend more time with her. Yeah, especially when Penelope is becoming more emboldened to be in the ton, maybe Lady Danbury starts to pick it up, like how she speaks yeah. and things like that. Mm-hmm. Or maybe Lady Danbury is has been her solicitor the entire time. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea that she sort of notices but doesn't mm-hmm. like just quietly lets it reveal. Yeah. And she, because maybe if we see her friendship with the queen as well, Lady mm-hmm. Danbury's, maybe it, it's like a tension where it's like, oh God, if she's going to figure it out, yeah. is Penn going to be at risk? Or it could be a moment where Penn thinks she is and then Lady Danbury is going to reveal that she knows mm-hmm. and be like, I've got you girl. Yeah. And then it's a tension between Lady Danbury, the queen and Penn. Well, I could see Lady Debra making a quip like this. I think it might be best if no one finds out before Colin, especially if there's also a bounty. I feel like an accusation like this, at least, yeah. maybe Lady Debra shouldn't vocalize her thoughts because mm-hmm. an accusation could be dangerous in the world yeah. of the show if the bounty has already been announced, mm-hmm. depending on when this scene takes place, if they adopt it. Yeah. And just in terms of Lady D, how much meddling do you think she's going to be doing? Is she going to get in- involved in Penn's mm-hmm. life? Is she going to help Penn? Is she going to nudge her towards Colin, nudge her away if she feels like, well, that's a doom? love i think she'll be meddling based on adjua's comments Mm -hmm. about how she kind of wants to intervene because there's no one else there to help penelope yeah to guide her and also because every year she's hosted someone or had somebody and this year she's not hosting anybody Mm -hmm. as far Mm -hmm. as we know well marcus is rocking up yeah marcus anderson is just showing up but maybe she doesn't want to Mm. deal with him you know she likes to Mm. she wants distraction meddle in romantic affairs yeah speaking of meddling guess who's going to make his grand appearance to take his seat next to Lady D just in time because the musicale is about to begin and Beans it's time choose your own bean venture Ba-da-da-da. Colin haphazardly bumps his way down the row as he tries to get his seat Penelope sees him give one of his lethal smiles to several girls in an apology to them how does she react does she A sigh <sighs> does she B groan <sighs> C moan <sighs> or D growls <sighs> What noise is she making at the sight of his lethal smile? (laughs) I want her to growl. She does. She growls. (laughs) She does growl. (laughs) Felicity's like, did you just growl? (laughs) (laughs) That answers why he's wearing that that animal um, waistcoat. (laughs) Yes. Yes. He's just trying to appeal to her baser instincts. Her... (laughs) stop growling pen or the performance is about to begin and Mozart is about to roll in his grave and you know what he's about to rock up here as a little tribute reincarnated spirit in the form of (laughs) musical beans beans please can you give us a vivid reenactment of this moment yeah I'll conduct you one two one two three go dink 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 did you go for twinkle twinkle little star are you joking me for fuck's sake, please. I sent you his bloody other... Oh. <laughs> dink, 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 dink. Dink, dink, dink. 
I was like, you can use this one or you can choose any Mozart piece and you've gone for Twinkle Twinkle the fucking star. <laughs> That's Thank not you. what I was expecting. <laughs> I'll... <laughs> you know what? You read the brief and you followed the brief. Sure did. <laughs> <laughs> profound, profound. Once the collective suffering has ended, ours will be going on for about another hour. The traumatised Ton are milling about with drinks in their hand. Penelope gets approximately 0.3 seconds of peace before Colin appears behind her. They take a turn about the room and he apologises for his early behaviour. I quote, for being such a whiny little brat. I feel like Reg, you were punching the air at that point. <laughs> Penelope too realises that he actually is entitled to his feelings. I appreciate you saying that. But he reminds him gently that he can change his life if he wants to. You have every right to your feelings. They may not be what I would feel were I in your shoes, but you have every right to them. Do you know what you sound like, Beans? You sound like those archive, and I don't know if any other of you, but they always pop up on my FYP, those archive videos of like British children from the 50s. And they're like commenting on things. I was like, I shan't think that I would like that sort of thing, but maybe some people would. <laughs> Some people just think that these things are too expensive. <laughs> but, uh, Veg, can you give us that whiny brat brat line? I apologise. For being such a whiny little brat, Penelope. <laughs> <laughs> so the subject matter of this is very, very different, but just let me go on the spiral here. This comment that she makes really gives me Emma vibes with that scene where Emma is trying to tell Mr. Knightley that it's okay to make his feelings known to her. We've talked about Emma in the 1996 version, which I love. 2020 is also great. Um, but in the 1996 version, there's a scene really like this. And of course, it's a huge stretch, but it could be a really poignant moment if Penn says something similar to yeah. Colin, either after their first kiss or later, where she acknowledges that he maybe does have feelings for her, but maybe A, she doesn't think it's love, or B, she fears reciprocating his feelings for some other reason because she's yeah. committed to her plan or she's worried about the queen or something else. Yeah. And that's the thing with friendships as well. It's like you're allowed to be a bit messy. You mm. don't have to be as perfect, which is something that they're broken down into so they can rebuild. Being able to sort of really talk candidly about your life and your fears and things like that and have that vulnerability. Yeah. Mm. She recognises that Colin only leaves the country when he's frustrated. Can't imagine what that would be like. Yeah. She So she proposes another plan. Instead of running away from all your issues, Colin, what can he do? He can do his journal. She doesn't realise that the subject of his journals is traveling but um anyway <laughs> penelope suggests that colin publishes his writing and we Ooh. so hope we see this in season three colin's reluctant at first again feeling insecure that no one would care to read or would not read it for the right reasons and the two push back and forth against one another pen suggests that his family would read it which to be honest, Pen, I don't. I agree with Colin here. I would hope the family <laughs> would read it. She's like, you have a lot of relatives. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the two argue back and forth a little bit playfully. Then our favourite cock block of the show, Eloise, pops up oh, in book form here and interrupts the two. Never change Eloise. Eloise tries to get them to share what they were talking about, but they both refuse. And that completely throws Eloise off that she's been cut out of the conversation by Pen. As fans of the show, we've seen quite a few occasions where the three of them find themselves in this little funny little pas de toi. And this reminds me of the wooden scene in 204 and <laughs> the pursuit of mankind scene in 206. A little trio moment, which we're definitely not going to be getting at this point. And the evening ends in a sweet moment of levity between the three as Penelope reflects that she is. So glad I came tonight. I can't remember a nicer evening. Truly, I can't. <laughs> I feel like, much like Eliza Doolittle or something, your Dickensian pen is becoming more refined. <laughs> <laughs> over time and as Colin is lying in bed later that night it occurred to him that he felt the exact same way <laughs> Penelope <laughs> my pollen heart I can't I can't either those were again <laughs> vivid vivid Penelope. interpretation of character I enjoy Dickensian pen Dickensian pen's my favourite you need to bring it down a few class levels I think <laughs> you've been told <laughs> <laughs> or just, just interspersed, like, sometimes she's really posh, and sometimes she's really like, please, sir, can I have some more? Please, sir, can I have some more? <laughs> <laughs> and so, if this is going to be the Ossily parallel in the books, will the Ossily ball end on a similar scene between the two? Maybe it's, like, slightly awkward, but then they have this levity, the friendship, and they both walk away being struck by having a truly lovely evening. 
What do we think? I think it's going to start out that way, but then mm. something's going to happen. Someone's going to talk to Penn or whatever, and then Colin's going to literally feel his heart drop into his butthole. <laughs> yeah. We also have to consider Eloise. We've been told that she's kind of mm. been going to stick to Colin's side, like yeah. Blue. That's the, yeah. like a spoiler for later in the book, but she may be trying to interfere with yeah. any pollen interactions. Editor's note, stand down, Hyacinth. It seems I might be the new prophet of doom around here. Now that we have the trailer, we do actually have a moment exactly like this at Australia, where Eloise is keeping a close eye on Penn and Colin. We spoke about this in our trailer reaction episode, but I actually just wanted to bring you a little update on that theory. In that episode, we theorized that Eloise had confronted Colin in the carriage before they go into the ball about his intentions toward Penelope, putting Colin in a weird headspace as he arrives. However, we've realized that the carriage scene actually takes place at night, whereas the Bridgertons arrive in the early evening, according to the stills we received earlier. So so it makes more sense that Eloise's interrogation of Colin takes place after the ball, on the way home, not on the way to the ball. If you remember from the trailer, Penelope and Colin have an especially good time together at Austerly, very similar here to this moment at the Smythe Smith musicale. In the trailer, Eloise watches them suspiciously. It makes sense that this is what causes her to confront Colin about it on the way home, again putting the idea of marriage with Penelope into his mind. Our theory still kind of works in terms of this being the moment that pushes Colin over the edge, just in a slightly different order. He goes to Austerly, has a genuinely lovely time with Penelope, someone questions him about it, and it forces him to look at the situation in a new light. Now, if even Eloise notices how close they are at Austerly, then we are wondering if this is really the event that forces people to notice the closeness between Colin and Penn, forcing Penelope to write a clarification in the next morning's Whistledown. Oddly enough, this is similar to what happens later at the Smythe Smith musicale, where Whistledown writes that Penelope and Colin were seen talking together, but carefully frames their conversation to seem far more uninteresting than it actually was. Either way, Eloise is definitely Definitely keeping a close eye on Pollen from very, from very early on in the season. So the next day, the events of the Smythe Smith musicale are the topic on everyone's lips and on the tip of Lady Whistledown's nib. It is noted that Colin Bridgerton and Penelope Featherington were seen in conversation at the Smythe Smith musicale, although no one seems to know what exactly they were discussing. With the writer theorising that they were discussing her own identity. We've touched on this before, right? But how will Lady Whistledown write about herself and them being seen together? Will it be a bit like this, where she tries to control the narrative and dispel rumours and make it like very, very light and like they were seen next to each other, but it doesn't mean anything. Of course, it doesn't mean anything. They were just chatting as old friends. Yeah. Will it slip out of her control? We think this is going to be an R in episode two where it's going to slip out of her control the closer they mm. get and mm. as you theorise Lecky it w- when she feels it's slipping either the narrative outside of it is slipping and people start noticing or maybe more likely the lines start to blur personally between the two that she then steps in and heavy handedly reinforces it in a whistle down I feel like she will downplay their relationship and at some point she's going to use Lady Whistledown to kind of drive a wedge Coming between them and remind yeah. him and herself and the Tom that that can't lead to anything we don't know exactly when she'll publish that issue that we see mm-hmm. Unicall and Holding so it could be the one after the Australia ball or it could be later in the episode yeah. who knows but I, de- I definitely think she'll be downplaying their connection for sure in more romantic news are we ready guys for an unremarkable friday afternoon in the heart of mayfair it's a couple of days later we're in a quiet drawing room on mount street you all know what is coming penelope is surprised to find that when mr colin bridgerton has turned up at her house to pay her a little visit this is classic chaos colin by the way he does not stop turning up wherever she is. Once he's gone, he is gone. First of all, she basically falls. <laughs> she. This is like the, is this the second or third time she trips? I think she trips also at the Smythe Smith musicale. I think we kind of glossed over mm-hmm. that. But she also like falls out of bed here or trips. I can't remember exactly <laughs> the, the circumstance, but this is the second time she falls head over heels for Colin basically Aww. in this book. But there's a lovely moment here where Penelope sees him and realizes that they've become friends in truth. It was magical. Even if he never loved her and she'd rather thought he never would. This was better than what they'd had before. You sound like Jennifer Coolidge now, actually. <laughs> That's great, thank you. I wonder if this is the dynamic that we're gonna see with Chopin, where she's back on board their friendship and she's like, we- we're actually friends now, there's no sort of mm-hmm. confusion, there's no sort of yeah. imbalance, and where she thinks that he's never gonna love her, but yeah. and she's trying to be like, this is better than what we had and this is as good as it's gonna get. Meanwhile, yeah. he is falling straight for her. Yeah. And she also probably thinks there's an end date on their friendship because they're probably not gonna continue to be friends after she marries. Yeah. Yep. TikTok. But Veg, our lovely book, Colin ain't looking too happy. What's up with him now? He's always in a bit of a mood, you know? Yeah, chill out, babe. So according to Penn, he looks distraught. <laughs> he very, very somberly informs Penelope that Eloise is 
uh, actually, wait, do we have anything to eat? Because <laughs> do you know what? He's got terrible news to impart, but actually, come to think of it, he's starving. It's a cliffhanger. He like properly like sets this up. It's like terrible news. And she's like, what is it? Yeah. He's like, grave news. And she's like, what is it? <laughs> Eloise. <laughs> she's like, what the fuck? And he's like, I've got any fucking sandwiches. I'm fucking starving. <laughs> Yeah, Penelope is pretty much about to murder him, I feel you, gal. And Colin finally comes out with it. Eloise is Lady Whistledown. Oh my god! <laughs> he <laughs> solved it. Maybe, maybe throw in a growl there. <laughs> a concerned growl from Penelope. <laughs> <laughs> More like a... <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, she's like, whatever do you mean, Colin? <laughs> whatever do you mean? Or she's, re- or she's a really bad actress, but he doesn't notice. So she's like, yeah. no, oh. no way. Whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever Definitely do you mean? Not. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, it's going off the rails, sorry. And what do you know? Penelope doesn't believe it. No way could Eloise keep such a secret from her best friend. God. Colin lays down his evidence. She's always covered in ink stains. She disappears when she writes. Pretty good detective work, to be honest, just ever so slightly misguided. Unfortunately for Penelope, Colin elaborates on his concern, saying that Elle will be ruined for being Lady Whistledown, worried about how many people she's insulted over the years. He doesn't hate Whistledown, but everyone else does, and... When she's unmasked, she will not be able to show her face in London. Lecky, you know from our emergency episode that people are quite a flutter at the idea of Colin having the worst reaction in the ton. We will get into this during the carriage scene, but do we think this is a little bit of sprinkling of nuggets? He is very concerned about being ruined. He's very concerned about safety. And he is distraught at the thought of the scandal and of Eloise being ostracised. And that might come into it a little bit later. Penn turns it on him and she's like, you're such a good writer. Maybe it's you. Never mind the fact that you're never in the country at all. Maybe it's you. Good point, Colin. Did you see his reaction? He like basically stops breathing because he's so overwhelmed at her praise praise kink <laughs> and Penn like genuinely thinks he's about to pass out she's like are you good do you need some what do you need like a doctor <laughs> he decides it's from the lack of food and the acute stress of thinking that Eloise is on the verge of ruination but it is actually because his praise kink has ascended so far <laughs> to the heavens it's given him altitude sickness <laughs> they get some lemonade he eats some cheese. You know what? I always think about the fact that he tastes of cheese during my first kiss. She tastes of lemonade. He tastes of cheese. Good combination. The Finches would approve. <laughs> Ooh. Maybe she's into it. Maybe Finch has rubbed off on her. Colin, completely lost in his little scandal spiral. We understand it. We've been on many a spiral before. It's casually says, Suppose I told everyone that I seduced you. <laughs> you would be ruined forever. <laughs> That, my dear Penelope, is the power of the word. Colin's brain self implodes. The laws of gravity. Well, 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 well. Can... first Penelope oh. freezes when he suggests that he might seduce her. She literally freezes mm-hmm. in place like a statue. She's like, What did you just say to me? Her brain collapses. How's Colin doing? I'm going to say he's not doing too great. He doesn't. He doesn't handle this all that well. His brain implodes. The laws of gravity collapse. The hands of every clock fall from their perches. Time and sense and reason and basically every other element that I can't remember cease to be as his entire sense of existence collapses onto wanting to kiss Penelope. (laughs) What does Penelope say, Beans, as his world entirely falls apart? Would you kiss me? (laughs) And how does he react? to that seductive little chestnut his life as he knew it was over he's so fucking dramatic that's it for him he is gone he is dead rest in peace sweet boy she gets embarrassed and immediately retracts it and then I love this moment for her because she she sort of is like never mind I take it back it's really awkward and then Mm -hmm. she pauses for a moment turns and says she won't forget it that she spent her entire life forgetting things and not saying them and never telling anyone what I really want I do really love this moment for her because it's such a moment Mm. of growth. We'll get into the the first kiss in the show in a minute because I think our our perception of it has changed massively. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the book, I like this moment where she retreats and then she goes, no, actually, I am going to ask for something that I want in life. And this is a pen that we're sort of finding at the beginning of the season where she has had all these setbacks and she's going, you know what? No, actually, I am going to do something and I'm going to get what I want. Yeah. Yeah. Colin takes this all very calmly by deciding he's about to die. (laughs) And she says it's all good. (laughs) What is this feeling? So oh, sad in the new Jonathan, Jonathan Bailey. Bailey. Thanksgiving <laughs> 2024. Well, well, well. You know, Pisces is a dramatic little guy. 
But Penn, our Aries, says, it's all good, she might die tomorrow. Why are the stakes so, so high in this story? And he's like, you're not gonna die. Don't say you're gonna die. It's like, everyone just take a deep breath. Everyone drink some lemonade. It's just... <laughs> what the fuck? Men are too dramatic. Well, she's like, I'm 28 and I've never been kissed and I might die tomorrow. And next year I'll be 29 and I won't have been <laughs> kissed and I might die then. It just kind of goes on and on. Yeah. And then our magnificent writer, the poet, the artist of words who captures love itself and transforms it exquisitely into the spoken word, our writer Colin Bridgerton says... (laughs) Delicious. Okay, so he loses his mind, imagining Penn's lips on his skin, his neck, his shoulder, and on his other places. And she says, please, and he immediately breaks. And he's done for, basically. And he has this moment where he's, like, so overwhelmed with his need for her. Mm -hmm. And then this moment where he says it humbles him. He looks at her and he's, I mean, he's seen this person a hundred times, a thousand times throughout his life, this constant. But when he looks at her, he sees something different. He says she was different, she glowed, she was a siren, a goddess. And then he wondered how on earth no one had ever noticed it before. (gasps) And then what happens, Lecky? They kiss. It was glorious. Oh, this was a kiss. She tastes of lemonade, he tastes of cheese. He gets a little <laughs> overexcited and very thoroughly feels her up. Yeah, he's just he's going for it. Rubbing his hat, he's like, oh, I just put my hands on her bum, you know? Like, no, that's not appropriate. It's 1824. I know. But let me tell you something. When you kiss somebody and they're into you like that, it's just, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> well, what is Penn's reaction here? Because he's <laughs> this for her, but What's she up to? She's just standing there as far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> he stops because he's like, why not? Oh, why not in this with me? And he says, a kiss, he murmured, lowering his lips to hers again, although just for a fleeting moment, is for two people. <laughs> okay, so now I want this line, but it has to be right when they start kissing. He has to go back in for another kiss and that's when she reciprocates. Oh my God. Because in the book, this happens at the end and that's not okay. She can't be frozen mm-hmm. through yeah. the, you know, the bum and yeah. the, all of that. <laughs> he has to be like speaking on her lips. Like, yes. Mm-hmm. A kiss is for two people. Oh! Yeah, he, he goes in for a kiss and then, like, he pulls away. He says that they go back in and it's the glorious kiss. And, Bam. You know, so on and oh, so forth. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that thought, Lecky, because we're going to return to maybe a little moonlight scene in a moment. Let's mm. just get these kids out of the room for now and then we will jump into the show. But how does this scene end? Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh. What the fuck? Baines is red ahead. <laughs> oh, you didn't know? No. I thought for sure you knew I would have made this a question. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, so he is like, boom, ravenous. And yeah. he pulls away. And he's, bear in mind, he's like, life has changed. He's seeing angels. His world, yeah. st- like, gravity has collapsed upon her eyes. And she just goes, cheers, mate. She goes, thanks. Thank you. Good game. And he is absolutely horrified because he thinks that she thinks he's kissed her out of pity. Mm-hmm. And he's just <laughs> absolutely like distraught over it. And he can't even bring himself to clarify that he didn't kiss her out of pity because mm-hmm. he's just completely losing his mind over the fact that he wanted to kiss her. And then he gets really annoyed about it and upset about it. And what does he do? He storms out. There's a lot of storming in and out of rooms in these books. So we have the pollen first kiss in the books. Now we've talked a lot in the fandom about how this scene in particular could be translated onto the screen. And there's a lot of discourse. A lot of people are like, we never want Penn to ask for it because there's no context in the book because there are such different journeys there's such different relationships. They never want her to ask for it. They never want her to like bring herself to that level. Before all the Moonlight stuff came out, I'd always kind of been on board with this scene fitting quite naturally into it yeah i'd always thought that we'd have this in the frame of like a lesson where you have pen mm-hmm, entering mm-hmm. this scene from a very clinical perspective of like yeah. education is great yeah. and <laughs> being like this is another lesson obviously she still lives but she's like telling herself like educational purposes only this is not for entertainment mm-hmm. and he sort of cockily is like yeah of course we can do this i can i can like handle this no worries and they just end up on this conversation he starts to be like i'm starting to lose track of this conversation because i'm getting so distracted i didn't yeah. expect to take this turn mm-hmm. but acting really cool and she's like you know what you my pal you my good old mate do us a favor it wouldn't come from like i'm never gonna be kissed it would come from like 
I need practically for you to teach me this. And he's yeah. like, yeah. And then he does it. And they have this moment where it collapses and all the feelings kind of come pouring out into it. Yeah. Yeah. But That's how I'd always seen this fitting into the show. Yeah. I've never been quite like on board with the whole lessons kiss thing because mm. in a modern day show, that would make more sense. Yeah, why would she be kissing him? Yeah, I don't think she would sort of worry about needing to kiss mm. someone she was courting. She's not going to be kissing someone. Theoretically, They well, she wouldn't kiss her husband until she's married to him, right? Mm. So it's mm-hmm. like, Point. there's no problem, you know, you're married by that point. So mm-hmm. I feel like she wouldn't need to practice that and she wouldn't be thinking about that. So I haven't completely... Mm. Or on with that theory. And there's been the other theory that this then would come from Colin being like, oh, you need to learn how to do this. But I've always felt that would be quite mm. like manipulative of him to do yeah. in that situation. Yeah. It's not that the kiss can't be initiated by him. It's just mean like, if it does come from him, it has to be they're caught up in something and it just happens. It can't be like yeah. plotted. I think that's more likely given how shocked, if we assume it does happen in the moonlight scene, given yeah. how shocked they look, it does mm. seem like it's less of a like, oh, let's have a kiss. Because I don't, I think you'd look kind of a bit, worried that you liked it so much but you would not look that shocked Upset. if you'd right. kiss someone. Lecky, what's your thoughts? Before the moonlight scene I thought there might be a moment where they have a really intense moment where Colin mm-hmm. maybe asks Penelope if she wants to kiss him mm-hmm. or like there's just yeah. kind of an almost kiss moment where he kind of calls yeah. out that tension potentially but the moonlight still kind of changed my opinion about how their first uh-huh. kiss plays mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Me too. I also wanted to say in the book it makes sense because she doesn't yeah. think she's ever going to get married so that's why yeah. she asks him to kiss her and the show it's a little bit different she's actively going to be trying to court someone or have someone court her yeah Mm -hmm. and so i would think that the kiss would come more about it could even be something like colin leans in and he's about to kiss her and but he pulls away because propriety Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. pen goes will you kiss me or something Mm -hmm. like that and it could tie into him realizing that yeah. she likes him and he may have another lucky theory what happens here is that it's a huge moment for him as a character and for how he sees her and how his world shifts yeah and we can have that shifting happen obviously we've seen the moonlight still and we've seen the moonlight clip that very few seconds and we've also heard that the dress has a specific name which made everyone start to think that the moonlight scene is the first kiss scene Mm -hmm. how has this drastically changed your approach to the first kiss scene i I feel like regardless it's going to be some sort of moment of passion between Mm -hmm. them where there's nothing left for them to do but kiss, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I feel yeah. like Colin is the instigator in this moment because I for feel sure. like he's driven Please. to seek her out and it, you know, he's yeah. propelled to this moment where he has to kiss her. But yeah. that came to me while we were just discussing whether she would ask or he would ask. I wonder if Penelope at some point could make a remark where she revisits the you would never court me comment yeah. when she either adds on to it or like replaces the word and she says like, you would never court me, you would never kiss me. Because by that mm-hmm. point, they've had some kind of charge situations and like Colin like just like that his mind sparks and he reacts to that because he realizes yes I really would want to kiss you even she makes a remark to be like oh nobody will ever find me desirable Mm -hmm. and Colin's like well that's not the case my dear I'd totally find you (laughs) desirable and it's like a challenge yeah also Now that we have the trailer, we've speculated that maybe in the fantasy version of the sequence, Fantasy Pen is the one to say those words to Colin as a twisted manifestation of his own mind and guilt. It would almost be better if this does all come from Fantasy Pen, and so Colin gets the idea to kiss her from himself, not from the real Pen. It's his own subconscious manifesting itself through his vision of Penelope, showing his own emotions are being sparked from himself instead of just being a reaction to something the real Penelope does or says. If this is a dream sequence, then it's interesting that Colin also returns to the Featherington house in his mind. As we described it in our reaction video, it seems Penn and Colin can't escape constantly returning mentally and physically to the exact place Colin broke Penelope's heart. It therefore would make a lot of sense for the first kiss scene to take place in the same location. We imagine that Colin will wake up from his dream, tormented by fantasy Penelope's words, before going to her real house to talk to her, only to end up recreating his fantasy of kissing her for real, leading to the reaction we see in the moonlight clip. I think this is a scene where it's maybe like a part of it especially like the Colin shift is going to be in it but I think in terms of the whole it was a Friday in Mount Street I think that's all going to be stripped away from what we've seen in Moonlight I do kind of think it's what we've said that she's going to write something he's going to get upset about it 
Mm -hmm. He's gonna go to her, what we believe now to be her garden. Do you think this is true? Yeah, this isn't true. Yeah. Or he has to contradict it in a way that he didn't before. He allowed words and perceptions to take over their relationship and he's like, this is rubbish or whatever. Or maybe she's been distancing herself and she's been avoiding mm -hmm. him. And he goes sort of het up in this mindset, not understanding why he's het up. And they have this moment where she's like, Whistledown's right though. This is how you see me. This is how you feel about me. And he's oh. like, and I like the idea where she puts the idea into his head, which is what happens in this scene in the book where <laughs> she kind of mentions it. And then the second she mentions it, he's like, oh my God. Yes. That's exactly what I want mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. it is going to come from him. And we've talked about Moonlight scene before, but it ends on this deeply upset or... Yeah. They just seem both so undone by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a thing where Penn will get wrapped up into it and enjoy it at the time. And then afterwards, she's like, oh my God. Penix. Yeah. I've just spent eight fucking months mm -hmm. stopping this. What the hell are you doing? Yeah. Editor's note, as we said, we recorded this episode back in March. Since we received the trailer this week, we have even more thoughts about this first kiss scene in the show, specifically to do with what we suspect to be a dream Colin is going to have about Penelope. We talked about this in our trailer reaction, and we'll touch on it again in a future episode, but we now think Colin will have a dream where he does kiss Penelope in her garden before he goes over to her house the next evening, still caught up in torment and confusion over his dream. The two end up kissing for real in the garden, leaving Penelope confused and taken aback as we find her in the moonlight clip, with Colin left in disarray. Not quite how it happens in the book, but we will happily take it. Thank you, Chaos Colin. Shall we, uh, shall we lighten the mood a little bit and go see how Buck Collins doing? He's not doing too well either, um, to say the least. He has to go over to his mum's, which he is not too thrilled about because he knows he's going to get ribbed about getting married. Once again, he storms out of his house, walks from Bloomsbury to Mayfair. Choose your own bean venture. Ba -da -da -da. So, we're over at Colin's house in Bloomsbury, but where yeah. exactly in Bloomsbury does he live? Mm. Colin happens to live next to A, a statue of Charles James Fox, a politician who not only supported the Americans in their war for independence, but dressed in the colors of George Washington's army, and who was so well liked by our good friend Catherine the Great that she purchased a bust of his likeness. B, William Wilberforce, a politician who helped lead the movement to abolish the slave trade and who opposed dueling, who also founded the world's first animal welfare organization mm. and was considered such a good speaker that one remarked upon seeing him speak, quote, I saw what seemed a mere shrimp mount upon that table, <laughs> but as I listened... <laughs> He grew and grew until the shrimp became a whale. Oh my God, what a backhand <laughs> compliment. See, the British Museum, once guarded by a cat named Mike and home to the Mesopotamian tablet, considered the world's oldest customer complaint from a man who was sold less than satisfactory copper, hmm. or D, the bakery on Pudding Lane where the Great Fire of London began. Where does he live? Oh my God. Great history research. Yeah, great. Yeah, that is, they're all true facts as well. Great choices. We're not bringing you lies. Are you going to go American independence? Are you going to go the shrimp? God bless the USA. Hey. Okay, so you're half right. <laughs> so that is one of the answers. <laughs> yeah. He does live next to a statue of Charles James Fox. There is another answer here. Do you think you can guess what one it is? He lives near Pudding Lane. It would be fitting if he lived next to a bakery, but it's actually the British Museum. Oh. Apologies. And he looks at Charles James Fox and he's like, a man who got shit done. If only I could be the same. <laughs> Bless him. So a rain sergeant Colin turns up in Mayfair, making small puddles all over the floor. He ends up going upstairs to change and bumps into his dear sister, Eloise. Bad timing, Elle. Colin's in a very bad mood for a change. And seeing Eloise makes him remember his kiss with Penelope and most of all, his guilt. He ain't too happy. Elle digs him specifically about why he's been visiting Penelope. She's just like, have you gone for my birthday plans? He's like, no. And then she's like, Hassel, you haven't. And he gets really riled because her mm. persistence to him is more evidence that his nosy little sister is yeah. Lady Whistledown. Yeah. He grabs her, chucks her in her room and angrily confronts her about it. What the fuck? Yeah, I mean, I know siblings can be a bit like rough with each other, but Colin, keep your hands to yourself. Eloise thinks it's funny and she's like, what a hilarious little bit you're doing until she realises he is deadly serious. Again, Detective Colin lays out his evidence, the ink stains, the fact that she's always in her room, the fact that she's a nosy little shit. Mm -hmm. And Eloise is suddenly pissed off because she's like, how dare you not believe me? I write a lot of letters. Yeah. And who's she writing to? Myself. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so she is so pissed off that he won't believe her that she storms out of her own bedroom. <laughs> 
I have to say, I hope the production design made some very sturdy doors for season three because they're always fucking stormy in and yeah, out. Yeah, all so, Judging from the comment Nicola made about broken furniture, I can only assume that even the most talented of carpenters don't stand a chance against all forms of Bridgerton fashion. So here we have it. Out and out, we've danced around it a lot in the past. We've talked about it before. Mm. Colin accuses Eloise of being Lady Whistledown. Is this going to make mm. the show? Maybe because we've seen hints of Colin suspecting her but mm-hmm. like it's never outwardly been said just like yeah what was that comment he made in season two about lady whistledown being really quiet and then like is that mm-hmm. right eloise he's given her like pointed glances yeah. but also not enough that if they didn't want to go down there they could not have mentioned it again and they could either go with it or not go with it one reason it would be interesting if they did adapt it is that it would be a moment of tension if colin is yeah. like i think you're lady whistledown and then we have this moment where mm. we're not sure how mm. eloise is going to respond if she's yeah. going to out Penelope or not. So there's mm-hmm. that dramatic tension there. Yeah. I don't think she would, but... And here, Eloise is furious. And what she's so indignant about is that he doesn't believe her. She says, you are my brother. You should believe me unquestioningly. Love me unconditionally. That's what it means to be family. Well, that's not the case. We have a moment where he confronts her. And as you say, Lecky, she doesn't out Penelope, but she's mm-hmm. fuming. Because, I mean, the last thing she wants is to be accused of being what Penelope mm-hmm. has done. Mm-hmm. If we're going to have a moment like this between the siblings where she plays on this idea of either she's trying to warn him away from Penn and he's like, why? And she's like, you shouldn't even question it. Believe me, I'm sister. Or maybe it's even where Eloise feels that he's almost betraying her by standing with Penelope in the fight. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you should be by my side no matter what. The only reason I brought this up is because both Luke and Claudia have made really interesting comments about the scenes that they've had together Mm -hmm. and how also it really brings Eloise's protective side out. Yeah, and I think we've kind of touched on this in the past that Colin's burgeoning relationship with Penelope may affect Elle in other ways. And especially once Colin finds out that Penelope is Lady Whistledown. Mm -hmm. There may be like moments leading up to that where she's like, you know, you really shouldn't waste your time on her and kind of Mm -hmm. infers that there's something bad about about Penelope he doesn't listen to her and eventually when they revisit that conversation he's like I already know and she's like taken aback by the fact that he's yeah. accepting of this thing that made her pull away from Penelope in the first place mm-hmm. where he moved forward editor's note on Saturday the 13th of April the day before I'm recording this note Bridgerton released a small promo video on social media showing Colin standing in between a very frosty Eloise and Penelope the ex-best friends can barely stand to look at each other clearly setting up some very tense moments for them in the season what's interesting is that Colin is caught between them both and indeed looks at them both in turn, perhaps foreshadowing how Colin will be caught between the rift between the two women and perhaps have his loyalties to his friend and eventual lover pulled against one another. Good luck, Colin. Well, he ain't handling it too well. How's our pen doing? Well, we're going to catch up with her a little bit later. What is going on? She's not doing too great as Lady Whistledown has very dramatically retired. (laughs) She's like, I'm done with this bitch. (laughs) Yeah. It is with a surprisingly sentimental heart that I write these words. After 11 years of chronicling the lives and times of the Beaumont, this author is putting down her pen. The column has grown wearisome of late, less fulfilling to write and perhaps less entertaining to read. This author needs a change. Gal needs a break. She's like, I'm not dealing with this shit. Forget it. This is very me, to be fair. Do you think she's going to retire or threaten to retire? I just... No. I can't see. I think they're at such different stages in their journeys. She's already given it up once in in season two, and I don't think she's going to do it again. Yeah, she's turned into it. Also, in the books, we don't see this, but at the end of Benedict's book, the previous book, you have this moment where it's like a vignette of Whistledown. We don't know it's pen. There's hints it's pen, but there's a vignette where she looks out and she realizes how tired she is (laughs) and how it has been such a long journey for her and that she does want want change and this is kind of what we see with Penn is that she is at a point at 28 where she does want something different yeah whereas I think Penn in the show she's so much younger she's younger within her journey as a writer as well Mm -hmm. and her relationship is like and it's that hubris of I'm at the top of the world with this Mm -hmm. and I'm good at this and it's the only thing I have Mm -hmm. yep it's the one thing I want to keep so later that evening we're going to the Macclesfield Ball where the retirement is the talk of the ton Violet decides she's bereft without Whistledown Penn very snarkily she does have some snarky moments with Violet she's like ugh Violet you're so dramatic she published 18 hours ago 
Yeah. You haven't had time to miss her. And I'm like, all right, Pen. Jesus. <laughs> Calm down, darling. Felicity and Hyacinth feel lost. Pen's like, we all need to get a grip. It's only gossip, Colin. Mm-hmm. So Pen is concerned when Violet explains that Ella's missing due to a headache, especially when she learns that Ella hasn't been feeling well for about a week and that Ella has been in a bad mood since she quarreled with Colin. Pen thinks this could potentially be related to the kiss that they had. So she starts spiraling too, being like, it's out. Everyone fucking knows. I wonder if this might come up in the show as well, the idea that Elle might stay home from a ball for once, especially if she's been sticking to call inside like glue, like we touched on earlier. This could potentially play out in season three, albeit with some differences, like to introduce tension. I can imagine Penn maybe panicking and thinking that Elle may have finally Mm. told Colin the truth if she thought they were becoming too close, maybe. Mm. Because that is an element of the tension, isn't it? That Mm -hmm. as they get closer, Eloise has a piece of information that can detonate it. And I'm not saying that in a way that I think Penn is going to attempt to withhold the information from him. Mm -hmm. I just think it's that having someone else have control over something and not knowing what they're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. It is quite sickening. So it's their friends and everything, but Eloise having this power that she can use at any time. But there is a very sweet moment where Penn realises that she met Colin on a Monday and she kissed him on a Friday. It only took him 12 years. But Penn feels like she needs to make an escape, which luckily is just when Lady Danbury swoops in again. Honestly, the hero of the episode, I have to say, (laughs) and steals her away to talk about the column because she may just be the only person with more than half a brain. As an amused Violet leads Felicity and Hyacinth away, Penn and Lady D have a chat. Lady Danbury likens humans to fine wines who get better with age and basically calls Penn out on her crush by asking if she's looking for Colin when she eyes the room. Mm. I like this idea that like Lady Danbury can pretty much instantly, when she's kind of caught for them both, been like, yeah. I see exactly. Like, let them stumble towards each other at a time, but occasionally give them a nudge. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Penelope basically admits it. And that it's unrequited tragedy of tragedies. Aww. Lady Danbury says, don't worry, babe. And Penn's like, oh, I've got someone on my side, which again ties into sort of what Adjoa has been saying that is going to recognise her and pull her in. And there's this very sweet moment where Lady D, a self-proclaimed meddler, we've seen her meddle in the past, says that she wants to see Penn being settled before. <laughs> Once again, they're all dying very drastically. <laughs> She's like, the only thing I want before I die is to see you young and settled. <laughs> happy and settled. Yeah, it's like she wants it to be happy. And then we have this lovely conversation where she really says that Penn reminds her of herself because she's not afraid to speak her mind and this takes Penna back a little bit because she can only really remember having spoken her mind in public at precisely one social event anyone know what this is this isn't pertinent to you guys listening in April but to us it's very pertinent a masquerade a Paper masquerade do you up. say mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah we know that Penelope has at least attended two masquerades one where she dresses like a leprechaun happy St. Patrick's Day blah 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 mm. but at the other masquerade she was dressed in a dress from the 1600s and I'm like Aww. if they're going to include a masquerade at the end of season three perhaps to tease Ben's story can we please have Penelope in the really nice dress that she wears from the 1600s as opposed to dressed as a leprechaun please thank you (laughs) imagine if that's like her final dress (laughs) her final outfit I've always liked the theory and I've seen it in I've seen it a few things that if there was a masquerade that she'd be dressed as the sun and he'd be dressed as the moon oh that's cute that would be sweet yeah thankfully she's not a leprechaun right now And they're having a great time chatting when once again, commotion breaks out. Someone's got an announcement to make. It's our nearest to dearest Cressida. Penn sort of gives her a lowdown being like, there's been bullying. It's been shit. I hate this bitch. Don't want to see her. Do you think Chopin might do the same? Do you think Lady Danbury's going to recognise this? I think people are going to know that Cressida has made fun of Penn. She may know the history. I feel like no need for exposition if we in the world (laughs) of the show know that there's been bullying. It's been made quite obvious. And it's all very stressful as Cressida begins to make a commotion. But then what happens, Lecky? Penelope also reflects that she wishes that she could defend herself instead of having the Bridgertons do so. She recalls a time when Antony came to her aid and played the hero, whereas as in, in the show we have kind of Colin swooping in to save her from Cressida. But I could also mm. see maybe show Penelope feeling this way as well. And I think that's why she should and perhaps will stand up to Cressida in a showier yeah. way later in the season. Not just like muttering a quip under her breath as we've seen her do previously. As Eloise has defended her as well. And then Lady Danbury notes that Penelope's Mr. Bridgerton is approaching and Penn is oh, heartened when you. Colin makes a face when Cressida's announcement is mentioned because he can't imagine being interested in anything she has to say. But then Cressida does the unthinkable and announces... Dun, ba, da, 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 that she is the writer. After the announcement, the chapter ends on a cliffhanger, but we're quickly going to flip to Colin's point of view, who has spent most of the past few days in a terrible mood, which is made worse by the fact that he's known for his good humour. He's gone to the ball, feeling extremely nervous to see her again, and beating himself up of the idea that Penelope had always been there, 
interesting and lovely and kissable, but he hadn't had the maturity to notice. So he's lost in his own little mind, as he always is during this book, being like, Penelope, Penelope, Penelope. And then for a second, he's like, oh, there is a world going on around me outside of my little <laughs> mental breakdown. And once Cressida has made her announcement, Colin joins a fray, and Lady Danbury is extremely sceptical, which Colin agrees with. But he's very sweet because obviously, poor Penelope is completely shaken by this whole revelation. And he really sees her, how upset she is. And his instinct is to get her out of the situation as quickly as possible. But not before Cressida comes over to claim her reward. Lady Danbury says she doesn't believe her and asks Penn her opinion. Penn panics, Colin's very concerned. Then what happens? It just as he's about to whisk her away from the trauma of it all. Penn simply changed right there in the Macclesfield ballroom by his side. She turns and stops and says, no, I have something to say. Lady Danbury is so proud. She says that Cressida is lying because she's always liked Lady Whistledown and... It would break my heart if she turned out to be someone like Lady Twombly. Is that how it's spelled? Yeah. Tumbly. Is it Tumbly? So in the audiobook, it's Tumbly. Lady Tumbly. <laughs> <laughs> but what a moment that's going to come back to bite her. Mark those word listeners because she's going to pay for saying that. In the here and now, it's all good because Colin takes Penelope's hand and squeezes it. He's so proud of her. Cressida Aww. is outraged. Lady Danbury is delighted. And Colin had to physically wipe the smile from his face. Very interesting Aww. visual. Uh, Lady Danbury gets rid of Cressida. The Bridgertons gather their thoughts with Lady Danbury and Colin. Hearing that Penelope has to return home, quickly arranges her carriage to be prepared before realizing regretfully that he helped her leave without really saying goodbye or being able to apologize. However, he can't bring himself to find the evening a failure because, dear listener, he'd spent the better part of five minutes holding her hand oh Oh my god like listening back i physically and a lot of people say this i do not know how i'm going to cope with the series because it's just (laughs) like just imagining these moments it's gonna be really fucking cute the last time i was like this was when i was watching like when i was into harry potter and i'm not into it anymore because i don't like jk rowling because she's an awful person but i was like obsessed with the ron hermione kiss and i all i thought about was like oh my god they're gonna kiss and like i assumed it was because i was a virgin i hadn't even been kissed (laughs) you know i thought this was just like me being like obsessed with kisses because i hadn't had a kiss but no you know you just like romance I'm getting it and I'm still pretty excited. (laughs) I I feel like we wouldn't be on this podcast if we didn't all like romance. Mm. Yeah. Even obs. Speak to yourself. Speak to yourself. She's going to fall in love the exact same way that Colin falls in love where she (gasps) thinks the world is fucking ending because she gets some bubbles in her (laughs) stomach. Oh. No, I'd be like, Eloise, like, are you fucking kidding me? Absolutely not. No, you're going to be fucking Colin for sure. <laughs> Don't worry, listeners, it will not befall me. <laughs> so what a moment to end on, as we say, very sweet. This is one of those moments where like, I can see this perfectly translating onto screen. Yeah. <laughs> the whole like him holding her hand. Yeah. And not realising it. And just holding on to her because he's so proud of her. Mm-hmm. And her not really, they're not really realising they're doing it for so long. But what do you think about the Cressida of it? Because would it make sense for Cressida to try and take credit for something that the queen is hunting down yes because i've mentioned this before cressida wants to be the talk of the ton and she is Mm -hmm. not for the attention or when she is the talk of the ton it's when lady whistledown is criticizing her so Mm -hmm. it will be seen as oh all those times that cressida was like criticizing herself she was being so Mm -hmm. selfless so interesting interesting, you know Mm -hmm. it'll flip it on its head a little bit and then people will be like she doesn't take herself so seriously in the carriage scene this is something that colin trips upon he's like it wouldn't have mattered as much as if it was Cressida because she can get away with it and you can't get away with it. And she's like, what did you fucking just say? But I wonder if it's the same thing where we see that Cressida can get away with declaring it because mm, right. she's seen so differently. Good point. And it's mm-hmm. like, it would yeah. be disastrous for you, yeah. but it's fine for her. Many people in the town may not believe it's her, but yeah. she may be accepted like there there may be like no urgency to (laughs) arrest her or you know people going after her because a they don't believe her and b they think oh it was you or you know i don't know it's interesting i think one they don't believe her and two the featheringtons are not as considered as highly as the cowpers Mm -hmm. even though a lot of the people in the ton do not like the cowpers they still respect them that same respect doesn't apply to the featheringtons Mm -hmm. and so she will get away with it because of her status within society itself regardless of how many people do not like her but they will probably also think she's lying because she does like being in the center of attention 
Yeah. And because the Featheringtons have always had this sort of griminess attached to them, the yeah. griminess of scandal or of Archie. Yeah. Lucky, yeah. you've touched on this before in previous theories, though, that actually maybe the initial, and we kind of touched on this at the beginning of the episode, the initial bounty is like funny and it's a game and the queen's mm-hmm. enjoying it and she's not annoyed by it and she's just like, do, 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 do something to keep us entertained. And I think in one of our past Crumbs episodes, you've theorized that when Cressida declares it's her and then yeah. it's found out that it isn't Cressida, the queen's like, mm-hmm. I'm fucking being embarrassed now. I want this person found now because it's getting mm-hmm. it's not funny anymore i'm getting embarrassed by her showing me up like maybe yeah. maybe we're still like taunts and be like haha you haven't caught me mm-hmm. yeah i think this is when the queen would be tired of the nonsense and that's mm-hmm. when it moves into actually yeah. now it's dangerous for you yeah. yeah and that's the tonal shift that might coincide with the the splitting of the season as well mm-hmm. yep way to end guys let's leave it there yeah. colin holding her hand beautiful i have to say this is one of my favorite moments in our last episode we tried to like pick a line that we wanted or like a moment per se mm-hmm. in the show mm-hmm. i think i'm gonna go for the bit in the journal scene where they had that conversation about what home is i think would be very mm-hmm. sweet mm-hmm. That is and a good one. the moment where they hold hands for five minutes my little heart would die yeah lucky what do you want to see i think uh a kiss is for two people Oh, oh yes yeah iconic in the way that you you and beans sort of laid out for us adorable yeah. veg mm. what do you want to see i want to see so i actually really like how he speaks in the narration about like how he's seeing pen differently because yeah. some of the things he says in the book he's it comes out a bit wrong there's some things he says here about how she's sort of changed and he's noticing her and like i think obviously we're not going to hear his thoughts but just seeing him mm. show that in his mm. face because luke's such a good actor they might be able to adapt some of it yeah. into dialogue maybe he'll tell will <gasps> It's such a difficult journey for him to go on where where he has to see someone different and he has to question where that's coming from. And, yeah. mm-hmm. and I like the idea that he's... And he, and he says it later where it's like, maybe I grew up. And then Penn's like, maybe we both grew up. Yeah. Beans, beyond Mambo number five, what do you want to see? <laughs> well, I agree the kiss is two, for two people, but also I really mm-hmm. love the hand-holding scene because I, mm-hmm. I love scenes in like romantic movies and stuff where the intimacy is so natural yeah. and quiet you know yeah mm-hmm. quiet intimacy it's a beautiful way yeah yeah and it's just like i love that kind of stuff so the hand-holding thing because it'll mean so much to them but nobody else yeah. is going to realize it mm-hmm. i love yeah. that shit pollen against the world yeah mm-hmm. and i know no one will do it but it's that sort of him not really realizing it is a very him thing to do mm-hmm. Him just being so proud of her in public and just that quiet moment between them. Yeah. So, so cute. Guys, I think that's it. I think episode two done. I think we're next going to see you with our book reread on hopefully the 20th of April for a very special episode. Hop in the carriage. We're off to church. Take me to church. Yeah, please take us to church. Take me to church, if not the others. I'll be the the reporter on the ground. I'll arrange for (laughs) trauma counseling for the footman. Just somebody needs to be taken to church, please. She's ready and willing. Yep. But in the meantime, Lecky, where can everyone find us? You can find us at WhatabarbPod on Instagram and TikTok. And if you're listening to us on podcast platforms, we're also on YouTube with some amazing, lovely collages by Beans. And if you're watching us on YouTube and you want to listen to this when you are not at home, then find us on all your favourite pop- pod- podcast platforms. And much like Colin Bridgerton, <laughs> I need to go relieve myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note... Mambo number five, take it away. A little bit of prudence in my life. A little bit of violet by my side. A little bit of Porsche is all I need. A little bit of Eloise is what I see. A little bit of damn bar and the sun. A little bit of Crescent all night long. A little bit of Francesca, here I am. A little bit of pen makes me all my own. That's violin. Do 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 do. Do 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 do